The next subject is big because it's about distribution. And it's very big because we live in a world where distribution is very is, is critical. I give you a simple example of my business. So as you know, I make cognac, I sell cognac. Uh, how are the sales? The sales are good, but yeah, I could sell 10 times more than what I'm selling right now. My problem is logistics. And so you live in America. If you don't see that there's a logistics problem, I don't know what you're doing. If you live in America and you don't see there's inflation, that means you must be very rich because prices are going up like crazy and everybody is impacted. Why are we impacted? Well, my cognac uh, last, um, uh, I have one container that's been two months in the north of France on the docks, waiting to go on the boat to go to the USA. Still on the docks, two months. So it takes two, before it would take two days, now it takes two months. So why does it take two months? It's because the, the container used to be 3,500 and then it went to $25,000 per container. So imagine the cost of the products when it's 3,500, how many bottles there is in a container? Um, there's like a thousand bottles just to simplify of cognac. Of wine, there will be 8,000 bottles of cognac because they, are, they come in a fancy box and all this, they take all the space. So there's only a thousand. And so you have a thousand and it's 3,500, which means it's $3 and five, just the cost of shipping. But now when it's 25,000, therefore means it's $25. So from 3.5 to 25, normally the, those costs are multiplied by three to the consumers. So which means if it's 25, it's gonna, my cognac, which was $100, and now it's gonna be $175 just because of the logistics. $175, Professor Vigneron, you're a pig, you're getting too rich. Why did you raise the, I raised nothing. This is just the logistics, but the trucks that are gonna take it from the port are also more expensive. And then everything is more expensive. And that's why we have huge inflation. So logistics is a big issues and understanding how to sell is a big issues. Where do you sell it? You sell it at Costco, you don't sell it at Costco. All of these are the things that we're gonna discuss. And it's very important to understand it because it has a huge impact on our lives. So here's an example. Here's a family, they're walking, they're skiing, it's the winter, great, let's go back skiing. What do you see that is common on that picture? What is the common denominator? They're all wearing gloves, that's true. They're all holding skis, that's true. They're all smiling, exactly. They're all smiling, they're happy. They have their gloves, they have their skis, the, the, I suppose it's the dad that takes a picture, the mom is, I mean, she's, she's almost gonna cry if she keeps uh, smiling so much, that's the next stage. And so life is good, but what happened five minutes after this picture was taken? The kids are over skiing, they're done. No, they, everybody's crying. Why? Because they dropped the skis, they dropped a glove. Where are your goggles? Where is your ticket? I dropped this, I dropped that, it's a disaster. So then you go, why is everybody dropping everything? Well, they're dropping everything because, you know, it's pretty cumbersome. You got your shoes, you got the skis, you got the poles, you got all of this, all this stuff. So then what is that? That's called a problem in business. If there's a problem, You've got a businessman that comes and say, I've got a solution for you. I'm trading skis. Okay, so then you have a very good product that's gonna make the people smile from the moment they go do the ski and the moment they come back from the ski to their after ski party and all of this, because they're just gonna drag it in the back. Is this a good product? Yes. Is the, is the product a good price? Let's assume, yes. Do you know about this product? No. Do people buy this product? No. Why don't they buy this product? Since it's so good. They the want to cry. It's useless on snow. Well, well yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard on snow and all this, but you, you know, you're still dragging it. So it, it still works somewhat. But the issue is not this. The issue is like, it's like the hearthing shoes. Nobody's heard about it. Nobody's heard about it. People don't know. It's one of those solutions to, 
one of the million solutions to the million problems that we have never heard of. So then in business, what's the secret of business? How can you make these keys be successful? What's the secret? How do you, let's be honest. Uh, I'm gonna open my heart to you and tell you how you can be successful in business. But your business students, you're all a third year, fourth year business students. That's what you wanna do. You've done it for many years. Let's hear from you. The, the, so you're really much an expert. How do you, would you make this successful? What do you do? Market the hell out of it. The, how do you do that? What do you need to do that? Have someone famous like um, endorse it, like show it on their like social media. All right. Find so, the target group. So what the target group? Sorry, what did you say? I said find the, your target group. So yeah, so find your target group. What does it mean? You're marketing towards like ski resorts specifically, whether or not they're the ones buying them or the people going to the ski resorts are renting them out. Yeah, so you could, you, you, what happens is when you're a small company, because you have to assume that skis is a small company, the last thing you have is money. So the biggest answer in business is money. So you, if you have money, you can market the heck out of it. But if you don't have money, which is most what people don't have, is therefore you can't. So then you try to do the most damage in the smallest place. So if you say, if I have to market it to the people, it's going to be very difficult. Well, you could do social media. Social media now is very expensive, very time consuming. You can't market. I mean, there's one person in a million maybe that can, but most people can't market to get successful. Most people, they have to do something else. So you go, okay, so to be successful, the professor just said it, you need money. If you're very wealthy, you're very likely to be successful. If you're wealthy, you could sell water to uh, someone that owns a fountain, you know? You could sell ice to a, a, a polar bear if you're very wealthy. You'll be successful. Two times, three times, five times, many times, that's a different story. But with money, you can make a lot of things happen. With money, you can hire, uh, who, who could you hire? You could hire the most famous celebrity and make the celebrity lie and say something that's absolutely false and pretend. It's true. With enough money, you can make anything happen in marketing. But the problem is therefore you don't have money. Therefore, you are, you are not yourself a celebrity because if you're a celebrity, that's a different story. You can do it because it doesn't take money. You're already a celebrity. But if you are not a celebrity and you can't afford a celebrity, what else can you do? Give it away for free. Yeah, and consider going to certain cabins and maybe hand a few of these out and hopefully you strike gold, right? So that's what the owner of this did. They went to a ski resort and they handed them for free for this and all that. And I think their sales was about $600 a month after hustling uh, 14 hours per day. They couldn't, they, they could only give them away. They couldn't get them to be bought. They couldn't make money with it. So they spent three, three uh, ski season doing that. The fourth ski season, they didn't know what to do. What, what should they do? They, now they were even more poor than at the beginning. Because it takes money to develop this. Because when you develop this, you have to patent it. Because it's pretty complicated patent. It's going to be maybe $70,000, $80,000 just to get the patent. Not the patent pending, the patent pending is $2,000, but the registered patent with a lawyer and all this that does all the, um, the design and all this of the patent, $80,000. Now they have to make some prototypes. You know, prototypes is gonna be thousands of dollars per prototype, 1,000, 2,000. Then they have to make some samples. They can't make 10 or 20 of these, they have to make hundreds of these. So then they're going to spend another $25,000 for their samples. So now they've spent $200,000. They worked for many years. They have a stock, their garage. They can't even put the, the car in the garage anymore. Both of them have a three car garage with full of this thing. The wife is not happy. The kids want to put their stuff in the garage. There's no more room. It's full of skis. They're starting to ask the in-laws if they can put it in their garage and the in-laws are like, no way, this is crap. What do you do next? Uh, you're the experts, you're the business people. What do you do next? Probably need a source with a bigger company that's already 
uh, making ski products and uh, yeah, so, so that's a good answer. Yes, yeah. so you look for a big fish that's going to help you. Yeah. So you look for a big fish. So that's what they did. They went to Shark Tank. They went to Shark Tank and they say, we're a very small fish, but we found a good idea. Skis. They show the skis. They told the truth. We're broke. You know, we just, all we have is our pants and, and this ID. Barbara Corcoran, look at them and say, you know what? I want 15% and I give you $50,000 for 15%. Obviously, because you know them, I told you they're broke. All they have is their pants. They said yes. But why did they say yes? For the $50,000 or for the 15%? Why did they say yes? Was it too much? Why? What's the benefit of Barbara Corcoran? And he you has choose. money. So, exposure, money. Exposure, money. What does that mean? Well, like you're targeting. I mean, I'm sure she's like successful, so she's going to make the company better. More exposure. She also has connections, right? I mean, she can yes. probably sell that to someone that has, you know, a bigger fish, right? Oh, yeah. So do you know the, what do these people do? Like what she did this morning? What do successful business people do? Look for opportunity. Yes, but where? Is this venture capital stuff that? No, they go play golf. Networking. They go to cocktail parties. That's what they do. I mean, yesterday, I went to Bruce Meyer's 80th birthday. Who's Bruce Meyer? Just put his name, Bruce, and then Meyer. M-E-Y-E-R. And then Beverly Hills. And you're going to see him with Steve McQueen, with all the celebrities, with all of this. He has a car collection of hundreds of cars and most, the average price is $5 million. He's essentially uh, beyond what, what's called in LA, Rodeo Drive. That was his 80th birthday. It was a VIP party for a classic car owner. And he invited 100 people to his party and you just go there. And that's, that's what they do. They don't go work in like people understand work. It's, a, it's work, but it's, 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 um, they don't fish for sardines. They fish for big orca. That's how they fish. That's why they work in the shark tank. It's a different ball game. So when you skis and you, you struggle is you need to understand that. And, and why do you need her? Not for the money. Uh, the money, if you think it's the money, you're wrong. It's not the money. It's the connections. Why? Because let's say you want to sell, you, you and I want to sell at Walmart. You know how you sell at Walmart or um, big distributors like this? Is you need to make an appointment. They have an appointment just once a year. We can show you. I got one uh, call just to uh, uh, show you this. I got this thing. It's in the biggest, uh, like the Walmart of, of Australia. And so they send me this. They say, hey, distributor, here, product re requirement. Does your product meet our buying principles? Vara Group aims to be America's most responsible drinks. I just changed the name on the country because I don't want to get in trouble, but they send me this. Um, Vara Group aims to be America's most responsible drinks distributor to deliver on our community commitment. We have strict guidelines in place on ranging products on how they are advertised and promoted. For example, we don't stock products or advertise in a way that might appeal to children and encourage excessive consumption. Nice, fine with me. Getting your product range with us, welcome. Like most retailers, Vara Group maintains a comprehensive, up-to-date range review calendar. So now, you know what? You're going to be on a calendar. I don't want to be on a calendar. You don't get deals when you're on a calendar. You get deals when you go play golf with the owner of Vara Group, not when you're on a calendar. Next, 
Throughout the year, we'll review our range in some detail. The calendar will give you guidance on when, for example, we may be reviewing our craft beer range, sparkling wine, or the dark spirit RTD category. This is the best time for you to submit your product for us for consideration. What does that mean? What does this mean between the line? That means that you send them the product and they're going to go, oh, I don't know, I don't know, mini, mini, mo, mini, mo, de, mini, mo. So it's good luck. Then relevant factors we may look at include sales performance, net margins, market trends, expected performance against competitive products. So essentially, you're going you're gonna to be put on the side. You're going to have to go on your knee and you're going to have to go bah, bah, and they're going to have a whip and they're going to do give me more for less, give me more for less. So you're going to be poorly treated. If you want to go in distribution and that's the way you go, good luck. It's many years, a lot of work. You're going to send a lot of samples and nothing is going to happen. However, the way, oh, sorry about that. I don't want to see that. I want to see that. Oh, so I have to close it. That's the traditional way. Oh, quick, can you see Barbara? Yes. OK, the other way these people do it is called connection. Connection is you take your phone. In your phone, you have the phone number of the owner of the VARA group. And you call and say, hey, Bob, um, I have that cocktail uh, in, on my yacht in Newport Beach on Saturday to celebrate the 12th birthday of my dog, Billy. And, and uh, I will send you a limo and you can come with your kids because Billy uh, loves your kids and they, you know, and that's exactly, they, it's family. And then they show up there and then they, she says, oh, by the way, I just bought, I just became a, of a part owner in skis and I would like you to put it in your store. And then Bob says, of course, anything for you, done. No, put me on the calendar, let me review, let me talk to about your margins and your performance and your expense and all that, done. Next, Comfy, the same thing. You can, you can go on YouTube and you can put Comfy and you can see the whole video. I can't show you the whole video now because I have too many things, but that's what they did. They were couch potatoes looking at each other and saying, man, we're broke. We're going to not eat tonight. What should we do? And they said, you know, we're so good at couch potatoes. Why don't we invent a sweater that you can sleep in it, slouch in it, leave in it for the rest of your life and, and go and metaverse with it, do anything you want. And we'll call it comfy. Yeah, but how are we going to make money with this? Impossible. We need a big fish. So then you go to Shark Tank and then Barbara gets it. The day after, actually, you can go on Shark Tank and Google it. They, they show on Google, they said, I think within two weeks, they became, they made $20 million. Two weeks, $20 million sales in two weeks after the Shark Tank. Why? She made three phone calls. Bed, Bath & Beyond, QVC, and Target. And they all bought. They had nothing to sell those guys because they only had two samples. But Bed, Bath & Beyond, and QVC, and Target, they bought hundreds of thousands of those comfy. They ordered them right away. Okay. So what's the common denominator here? It's not money. It's connection. The connection with who? with distribution. So how do you get rich and succeed? Is one, you're rich. Two, you're a celebrity. And three, is you marry the daughter or the son of Amazon because they have distribution. That's the only three way. There's no fourth. There's only three way. Okay, I mean, you could say you could, work with Barbara, I mean, that's the fourth way, I guess. Or someone like this, it's true. But the idea is she knows the, the distribution. She has, she, she, 
uh, yesterday when I went, uh, I took my son to this event. My son is 14 years old. I said, you come with me, you learn business. So you learn with me, you'll see a lot of nice cars. I mean, it was Ferrari next to Ferraris and all this. Pagani, I mean, the cheapest Pagani, $5 million. There was Ferraris from the 50s, 60s, anyway. So you look at this because it's a kid, he likes that. But I said, you see, we're going to have the best food, all of this for free. It's going to be amazing. And all of these people are going to have very white teeth, shiny white teeth, shiny blue eyes, and everything shiny, and everybody looks happy and big smiles. And that's just the way it is. That's, that's just, there's this crowd. And you go there. Life is good. And you're going to wonder why this person organize this whole thing for free for all these people to come because maybe he had a golf course to sell in Arizona and he was hoping to find someone that is going to talk and say hey by the way are you interested in my golf course how much is it oh 12 million dollars oh yeah let's talk about it on Monday and then maybe by now it's already sold the golf course you know so the expense of that event for this person is just um it's just an expense the same thing What's the name of our school? What's the name of your school? Nazarian, right? David Nazarian College of Business. I mean, Mr. Nazarian is a very nice man. And there's not a day we, sh we should not thank him for making this, um, this donation. But if you ask him, He's happy to make a donation, but it's not just a donation. It's an investment. It's an investment because if you Google his name before, you will find that he was associated with two, two buildings, one this and all that, versus now he's also associated with the College of Business, which is one, a number of students, one of the biggest in America. So people hear about him in a different situation. Now they hear about him as a big philanthropist. It puts you in a different ball game. When you meet with people, when you exchange your reputation and these kind of things, totally change everything. So he, I think he gave $20 million, it's a huge amount. If you ask him, and I know it because I met him several times and I always very grateful for what he did. And every time he told me, he says, no, Frank, this was an investment. You don't have to thank me. I know what I was doing. And I'm glad that it's good for people, but it's also good for me. It's an investment. So. People in business have a very different scale. Last week, I showed you a program where it was about rich dad, poor dad is the same mentality. Is in business, you need to understand what is money and that business is a lot about money, but deep down, it's, it's more than money, it's interest. It's people interests because people don't equate everything in, with money, but they also equate things with what is their interest in what, what they do and what they can gain. If you don't understand this, I can teach you distribution, but they, at the end of the day, you're not gonna understand very much, but just the basic, like the textbook. If you read the textbook, everything I've told you today is not in the textbook. The textbook gives you the flat perspective, you know, so the flat perspective like this, but it's important, the flat perspective too. The flat perspective is you have a manufacturer and you have a distributor. There's a cost in manufacturing and a cost in distributing. And therefore, you don't want the manufacturer to carry the cost of distributing. You want the cost of distributing and the activity of distributing be carried by the distributor. That's what the textbook says. I mean, it takes five pages to say that, but essentially that's what the textbook says. Very important to understand that. So what you need to understand is that there's a cost in distributing and it's not free to distribute. People that distribute make a lot of money. People that distribute for the most part, make more money than people that manufacture. Have you heard of Amazon? Yeah, yeah, so you've heard. That's how you make the most money, is by distributing, not so much by manufacturing. You want people that manufacture because you know it's important. If you look at the top 100 richest people in America or in the world, is you'll see there's not a lot of manufacturers. Well, then you'd say, yeah, but also they're using all kinds of way not to pay tax and not appear in the 100 richest and all that. It's true, so it's not totally realistic, the ranking. But at the end of the day, manufacturing is not that good. And that's why I was telling you about the French gentleman called Bernard Arnault, 
which is number three or number two or number four. It just varies week to week. And in a way, it's impressive because he's into manufacturing versus the people that are usually at the top are just making, you know, uh, license this and distribution this and a, uh, an application to do this and all that. I mean, this is like, um, it can change overnight. It's like a MySpace business, you know, the biggest business, MySpace. And the next day it was, what is MySpace? We don't even remember. When you manufacture, at least you have something. It's, it's a little bit uh, more stable, but it's not, 100% more stable because obviously you have competitors and there's new innovation and things get disrupted and all that. So you can also be overnight, nothing, but it's not as fast as, as being a service and so, sort of in distribution. Yes, Dylan, you have a question, a comment, maybe. Oh yeah, I just wanted to comment on that is because it's such a good point that, you know, networking and making friends is the very basis of business. and. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves often that times, because like with manufacturing, for example, if a person's wanting to sell a fashion brand, sometimes, you know, they, they make friends and they, and they happen to meet a friend who happens to work at, you know, a t-shirt warehouse or something. Yeah. And then they're able to get a good deal on a t-shirt or like, you know, whenever they're giving out these, uh, that ski product, chances are, even though they were giving those products for free, they were making friends with the person that they were giving the product to. Yeah, like they were making long lasting connections somehow, some way, just like with real estate, you know, folks can visit the, the estate, but also it's meeting with the person who's, you know, who's managing and, and all these different things like, you know, attending those nice parties that because it's, it's, it's about like the culture. Yeah, a lot of the time. So then, similarly, um, I think we often because of I don't know, per perhaps it is within our media structure that, you know, we, uh, that risk averseness has to be, uh, you know, people have to be ready to go out and meet people. Yeah. People have to be go ready to, to attend those events. You know, we often get shy at times. For um, sure. And, but you know, it's, it's coming out of our shell kind of thing. And that's, uh, that's also kind of connecting with like sports is that, you know, basketball games, yeah. uh, you know, the, a lot of the basketball teams, I think it was, I'm trying to remember the, um, I don't know, one of the, uh, the owners of the LA Times, for example, uh, he has, he got interested in bit, bit basketball and he became friends with Kobe Bryant yeah. or something like that, even though those are like, you know, big fish, but on the middle class level, you know, everyone, everyone starts out somewhere, you know, we just, somewhere. that's the best thing about, you know, all of us are in this college thing. We should all be, you know, having parties and, and. And thankfully during the spring, you know, campus is going to be opening up. So everyone, you know, I hope to see everyone there. <laughs> yes, but th th thank you for sharing this. It's very personal comments that you're telling everybody. And that's what I was trying to raise here today because that's, that's how it is. Uh, you have to be constantly, a, a, a successful business person is someone that is very social and it's someone that is very focused and it's someone that is constantly looking for opportunities. Uh, last night, I have a friend who, um, who makes um, little plastic um, ca caricature, little miniatures. And they are like a manga from Japan. And now I know he's making, uh, working with Warner Brothers and he's making um, all kinds of things for Warner Brothers that he sells. And when I was there last night, I said, hey, are you doing anything with NFTs? And he said, yes, with NFTs, now I'm making small Warner Brothers licensed products that we're selling to NFTs. And he says, what I used to sell in one year, I sell in 25 minutes through NFTs. And then I told Amazing. him, I'm, more, I'm yeah, it's, it's changed my, 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 my uh, business. <clears throat> and then I told him, hey, I'm working on this paper. And I told you this a few weeks ago with my uh, friend from Harvard Business School. And we're working on the luxury goods and all this. And then he's like, hey, if you want to do this with your friends, we can use my minting platform that I use with Warner Brothers and we could be minting some luxury goods and we could be working together. And it was already starting to make a strategy how we're gonna, and the reality is that it's very new to me. And so it's like, maybe I'm gonna start minting some luxury goods or whatever. It's a, it's a crazy world, but that, that's when you're in business, you're surfing on opportunities, but to surf on opportunities, you cannot be isolated in your room meeting the same people all the time you need to get out and you need to uh, 
I remember I was flying a lot before, and I made it. Um, a, a, I made an effort every time. Sometimes I, I would take like per uh, semester, I would take like forty planes and all this. That was a lot. I was every week in the plane, and I made an effort to talk to some people, either in the waiting room, either when I was in the plane, speaking to the people next to me and all this. The amount of contacts I made that way was amazing because you fly so often, you have also people that fly and sometimes they have business that are connected, disconnected, or they know someone or whatever. And I would say, you know, I'm paying for this flight. I'm going back home. I'm going somewhere. I'm probably next to someone that has the same sort of situation. Why don't I share and make a connection and at least I gained from this plane ticket besides the fact I am trying to go somewhere to gain from it. This is also a time to do business. And so I was constantly doing that. That became harder because people, the minute they sat in the plane, they plug their phone, they plug their whatever, they put their earpiece. And it, I've noticed it became harder and harder, you know, since like 2015 or whatever. People are not connecting as much. People are sort of being disconnected, I found. So I don't know when we come back from the pandemic, I'm afraid it's not going to be better. Um, I'm afraid the younger generation, I don't know how they're going to be, but anyway, I'm sounding like an old fart now, but uh, so, but, but that's-, that's Well, on the other hand, it might be that uh, new opportunity because yeah. even there might, might be an increase in shyness, there's also an increase in, you know, in risk-taking possibly like, you know, there might be five people out of 10 that are going to be like, okay, they don't want to go outside. And they're going to stay home, play video games. Yeah. And they might socialize via video games. Yeah. But then the other five, they'll be able to say, okay, well, you know what? I, I was so tired of staying inside that I'm going to go out and I'm going to, you know, attend a dance party with my friends, or we're going to go out golfing. We're going to go out hiking or something, you know, and we're all going to put our grounded shoes on <laughs> and, and we'll connect over that because then there'll be that space. I don't know, you know, maybe that, that might yeah. be that the new, uh, kind of the kind of one of those strategic phenomena that that could happen in the long term yeah i think you know my perspective every time is when they step down you step up my daughter this afternoon she had an office hours with a professor from ucla and she says oh i can't believe it the professor gave me an office hours and he said he was sorry he was driving and we were going to have the office hours while he's driving and i say well that's not really cool but and, I, and she says, should I use the video? My daughter used the video all the time. I said, do you, do you use always the video? Use the video. If they step down, you step up. But she said, I'm, I'm the student and he's the professor. I say, it doesn't matter. If they step down, you step up. And so that's the, the way it is. And I think that's what you need to do is always step up. If they step down, you step up. So if these people get stuck somewhere, you keep on going and you need to find your own space you're in business you're not going to be a nurse or something like this you need to think like a business person if they step down you step up anyway so distributors thanks thank you very much actually for um, uh, commenting and all that i very much appreciate it so what okay. is a, what is a distribution channel it's a set of interdependent organization that are called intermediaries that will be involved in the process of bringing the product or the service to the consumer so uh, this is a definition. I mean, you need to read some definitions so that way you know what you're talking about. But the key word here that I want you to remember is the word intermediary. That's why I put it in bracket. Probably I should have put it in a different color. The idea is, um, is you have to, to do good distribution is you have to work with other people. And these other people are specialty people that do something that is an intermediary between you and the consumer. And therefore they bring value. If they don't bring value, you don't need them. Can you work directly with the customers? Yes, you can. But if there is some value in having someone in between, you should have these people in between. So here's a, a map, and I'm just gonna take a break after this because I'm sorry, I went beyond uh, a little bit the hour, uh, hour and a half. So th there's multiple ways to, to distribute. One way it's called direct. That's, that's the one that's been growing since the mid nineties, mostly. Before it was the catalog way, but the catalog is the old school way. So since the internet, that has been a revolution where manufacturers can sell directly to customers. There are some people very successful with this. Uh, there are many uh, businesses that are not successful with this because it's still not that easy. Um, and sometimes you have to belong to a platform. So the platform became very successful, eBay, Amazon, and then um, uh, the, the people that were at the catalog that went online, um, 
using the online system as well became successful when they made the transition. So indirect is when you start using some intermediaries. So R, just so you know, is retailer, they retail, and then W is wall seller, they wall sell. So sometimes you just have a wall seller, sometimes you just have a retailer, sometimes you have a wall seller and a retailer, and sometimes you have also another intermediary between the wall seller and the retailer. So I have not explained what are retailers and wall sellers. That's something I will do as well uh, later. But essentially, a retailer is someone that whose purpose is to sell uh, goods to the consumer directly. So it's more of a B2C versus a wall seller is their uh, goal is mostly to sell to a business. So they are B2B. There are some wall sellers that are also B2C, but that's an abnormality. The normality is that wall sellers are B2B. So if I had to say a percentage, it's like a 95, five, 95 walls percent of wall sale is to businesses and 5%, sometimes nothing, sometimes more is to the consumers. But the retailers mostly sells to consumers that, that can also be uh, businesses, but they, these businesses actually buy the product for their own consumption versus for the wall seller. Oftentimes they will um, uh, uh, transform the product for someone else's consumption. The J is, is a jobber. So how do you spell that? It's J-O-B-B-R. No, sorry, J-O-B-B-E-R. So jobber is someone that is an intermediary that will not usually uh, take possession of the, of the products. So if you're using like a truck company between your wall seller and your retailer, that trucking company does not own the product, they only uh, transport the product. If you're using an advertising agency that has a function of organizing some, uh, some events, uh, we had someone that came about a month ago that worked into the multimedia for manufacturers in order to speak to consumers or businesses. His job was to be a jobber and therefore they were an intermediary in the uh, channel of distribution. Also sort of overlap with the channel of communication at the same time. Um, they can be a broker. So I will talk about broker more in length later, but the brokers are very important. So the distribution channel function is to collect information from the manufacturer and give it to the consumer, promote, create contacts. Matching is the idea is that they, um, they're gonna try to distribute the product in the right place. So for example, for my cognac, when I sell to, um, Bevmo, uh, I don't sell in all the Bevmos or all the total wines. I only sell in certain Bevmos and total wines. I don't decide which one. Bevmo and uh, total wine decide. These are the two biggest uh, distributors of alcohol, uh, retailers of alcohol in um, California. They decide based on the zip codes. So my cognac has a, has a characteristics and a, a reputation that only works for a certain group of customers. This group of customers are more concentrated in some areas. Each one of their store has a profile of type of customers. And based on the quantity of my profile in the profile of the zip code where that store is, they take my product and put it on the shelf. So there's some Bevmo, if you were to put my product there, that would, I would sell nothing. That doesn't mean that my product is bad. It just means that the, my target, the people that usually buy my products, don't belong to this, to this, they don't live in this area, or at least they don't shop in that store. So because my product is more of a niche product, differentiated high quality, in fact, out of 100 Bevmo, I probably sell into 25, that's all, right? So it's a smaller percentage. So they will know based on the matching with my target and their uh, target within the area. They negotiate. So obviously, you know, uh, retailers don't negotiate very much, but wall seller negotiate much more. They do the physical distribution by looking at inventory and stock and moving it between different places, the warehouse, from the warehouse to the shelves and all these different things. They also finance because they give you a deposit before you, I mean, they don't like to give a deposit and no many do, but when you're talking about my uh, importers, for example, or large distributors, when they make a purchase order, there's a percentage of deposits that they have to make. And then there's special terms for the payment. They take some risk because they, like in my situation, I'm not a, 
uh, a main brand that everybody's looking for. It's more of um, a product that they, they sort, sort of find out if they search. Uh, I don't advertise all over the place. So because it's not the main brand, they take some risk when they take my product. But it's not just me. I'm not like the loser brand. That's the, the most common situation. Most brands are not known by people. Yet distributors have to take chance on, on these for multiple reasons, including the reason that usually they make a higher margin on the lesser known brand. Um, because like my watch business, um, my watch business is more of, is a bigger margin than the, the famous brand of watches. So the thing, I don't want to say the percentage because it's sort of, um, uh, what's it? It's, a, it's like a, a trade secret. You, you don't really say your margins. So I don't want to say that say that to 110 people, but the Rolex, for example, has a specific uh, margin, and uh, usually it's not as good as the less known brand. So the less known brand are, may not be as expensive, but they have a bigger margin for the retailer, which is an incentive for the retailer to sell other brands than the big brands that everybody knows. And that's one of the strengths you have when you're a smaller brand, is you offer more margin to the distributor. As you may remember, there are strategies, corporate strategies. So they are the high level strategy. And then you have the sub strategies, the strategies at the P level. And since we are doing the P of place, sort of the term that's supposed to tell you about distribution, the P of place, we are looking at pull and push sub strategies. These strategies of pull and push are not only distribution strategies, they are also communication strategies. So they work in, a, in the P of place and in the P of promotion in both cases. So I, I'll explain to you what they are. Um, it is not very complicated, but it takes, it's not something that you have been very exposed to. So you have to sort of probably pay um, attention to the details. So these two strategies work uh, in uh, the opposite direction, if you want. The pool strategy is a strategy that consists in building a consumer demand through the channel of distribution. So it's not like you're talking to the consumers, you're communicating or you are um, promoting your product to the consumers for the consumers to want your product and search for your product is what you do is you're mostly incentivizing the distribution channel to carry your product. And once they carry your product, your customers will buy or customers will buy your product because they are being exposed to it. So the pool strategy consists in saying, let's be where, it, let's be in the places where it matters the most and or let's be in as many places as possible. So that way we can be seen by the customers. So if you can imagine that if you sell your product in one place in California, you're not going to sell as much as if you sell it in 5,000 places. The exposure is going to increase the, your chances of being selected. In fact, most people may think that because they see your product everywhere, that your product is therefore popular and therefore they'll buy it thinking that it is a successful product because they see it everywhere. But that poor strategy is not developed based in being the best product for the evaluation of the customers that is based on being on convincing the channel of distribution to carry your product. So your expense is to convince the distributor to take your product. So how do you convince them? You convince them because you have a quality product. You convince them because you have a good margin. So they make more money for them. You convince them because you have a plan to make your product become popular and therefore they don't want to miss out and they want to carry your product. Uh, you convince them by giving them a discount. The more they buy of your product, the smaller the price of your product and even the greater the margin they're going to be making selling your product to the uh, customers. So the incent incentive, the um, negotiation is with the owners of the distribution channel and this is called a pull strategy. Now, the opposite of this is a push. Um, oh, oh, I um, said the opposite. Pull 
So that's, that was push. What I just defined was push when you, the, you're working through the distribution channel. And so you, the incentive is to promote your product through the owners of the distribution channel. And this is called push. So why I made the mistake is because there is a visual way to remember it. What is push and what is prone? So when you're pushing, is you have to imagine you're the owner of a brand and you sort of have to push, which means that you have to push it through the distribution channel. So who do you have to convince first by pushing it is the owner of the store, for example. So you convince the owner of the store to take your product, even though you don't have a customer that wants to buy the product, therefore you have to push your product, let's say inside that store. So the push strategy is a strategy that um, for the longest time, it was cheaper than the pool because the pool is the opposite where you convincing the customers to want your product. So for the longest time, the pool was the most expensive because it was the manufacturer convincing directly the customers to want to buy the product. So imagine you have a time zero and at time zero, you sell nothing and nobody knows you. The manufacturers don't know you. The customers don't know you. Uh, let's take the example of ski -Z, this accessory that you put on your ski in order to carry your ski by dragging you the ski behind you, which is easier. So nobody knows your product. So in that situation, you are doing a pool strategy, which means convincing the customers um, to use the most uh, stereotype um, image is you're going to use uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, ad in the Super Bowl is the stereotype typical pool strategy, which means that nobody's selling it, nobody's buying it, nobody knows about it. But then they see it on the Super Bowl, and then right away they take their phone and they put skis because everybody's seen it. It was a funny ad, it was an ad that they like, and they quickly realized that they sort of felt that they needed it. And that's the pool. Now the push, which as I said, for the most part, is oftentimes cheaper, therefore more business, small businesses can do it. And since there's 90% of businesses are small businesses, so it's more common, is to do the push, which therefore consists in creating the momentum to the store. And then when it's inside the store, it's to the benefit of the store to create the momentum inside the store for the consumers. So that one is uh, cheaper in the sense that you could convince a um, store to carry your product. So a store, it doesn't have to be a physical store. It can be an online store as well, obviously. But you can convince them by telling them if they buy uh, 10, you give them one for free. And if they buy 20, you give them three for free. So the store will buy more product because they will reduce the cost for them to buy the product and therefore increase the margin for selling this product to the consumer. So the incentive for the store uh, is to uh, carry more because they make more money from the profits for each product. Um, normally when they make more money, they will put them in better places. So you can imagine if it's an online store, they're gonna put it inside the new this week or the best product or the recommended by Paul, Paul, the owner, and all these kind of things, you know, um, because, because of the push. Um, the push may be that you uh, give them some uh, funding as well to the retail store in order to participate in some of the um, advertising expenses. So the uh, store as, uh, as a promotion, and they're gonna be um, uh, ma making some uh, banners and pay for banners, or they're gonna um, create some mail um, that they're gonna mail to their best customers. They're gonna create an event or whatever. And therefore they pay for that. But most customers think that it's, it's paid by the store, but 99% um, of the time it's paid by the brands inside the store. So what the store do is they go see the brand and they say, we have this event and we would like you to pay for the advertising of the event. We would like you to pay for the valet parking of the event. We would like you to pay for the 
uh, food that would be provided at the event. So they make the brands and the brands that pay for this, they get preferential treatment during the event. So they will be put in a, at the entry or close to the cash register, or they will be mentioned in the um, agenda or the newsletter or something like this. So push is sort of more controlled because you pay for something and you deal with the business. So it's a B2B and you are more likely to get something back. The uh, pool strategy um, is mostly, you know, mass communication. Um, you pay an uh, influencer to talk about your product. Then the influencer is posting uh, your product. In fact, the biggest influencer um, in the brown uh, spirits and cognac is actually going to post about my brand tomorrow. It's the 7th of December. I'm just realizing that. So tomorrow is going to be posting um, about my product on his uh, social media and everywhere. And so tomorrow I should see a little blimp in my sales. My sales should go up by 5%, 10%, 20%, whatever. So um, the, uh, the way you structure this is you pay that influencer upfront or you pay the influencer based on the sales or both you know, on the sales and upfront. And, um, and so that's why social media are not, it's not free or even cheap anymore because the better the influencer, the more expensive it is to be working with them. But then you get what you pay for it. You give it to an influencer that is not, that is free. Uh, you're not gonna get anything much, you know because nobody followed this person. So that's why there was a time where I had to adjust myself because there was a time where the pool the strategy was uh, becoming cheaper because of social media. Because with social media, you can speak directly to the customers and incentivize the customer to want to buy your brand. But now uh, it's becoming more and more expensive to the point that it's gonna be almost the same as traditional um, advertising. It's not there yet but it's getting pretty close, that, that um, uh, it's going to be still pro strategy, the more expensive. Do you have any questions? No questions. Okay. So now I'm thinking about, you know, how can you use this? Well, what's interesting about this is therefore, that's what maybe this helps you to remember what is push and what is pull. See, push is the producer working through the channel of distribution. So I'm, I put like a hand with, you have to imagine it's like money. So it's the producer that's giving money to the wall seller, to the retailer, and then that's passed down to the customer. This is push in the sense that you have to push the channel of distribution to do their work. It may sound crazy if you have never worked in this industry, that you have to incentivize the distribution network in order for them to work. It seems like crazy because you would imagine that if you're a distributor, you are doing your job and that's why you, you are being good. No, distributors for the most part are lazy and they don't do very much. And so they expect not only to be making a bigger margin than the manufacturer, but they also expect the manufacturer to give in money and to give discounts and to give free products in order to, for them to, uh, to work versus the pool is you speak directly to the consumer, but you need the help of the retail intermediaries in order to get your product through the channels. So, so therefore, as a conclusion for this, is you can do both. The best is to do both. It's more expensive, but it's more effective. Uh, the bigger your company, the more you can afford the pool, like I just mentioned. But the other thing that is also interesting uh, to think about is, um, when you do which one, you know, so maybe there's a seasonality of the sales. So there's some sales sometimes, let's say about Christmas. It's Christmas, before Christmas, you do a lot of pool, which means that you talk to the customers. And during um, the end of the year, you know, so like you do pool before the 10 of December, and then you move into push after the 10 of December, because you want to incentivize, um, the, the sales at the point of sales. So sometimes the incentives is even directly directed to the customer, 
which is it's at the point of sales where there is a discount. The customers can buy two for the price of one. Two for the price, two for the price of one at the point of sales. This is still a push because it's true the distribution network. At the end, what is the what is it that you need to do as a business in order to not be suffering from the from the situation of distribution like this? Is you need to build a brand. The more you build a brand, the more you will mitigate, the more you will reduce your dependency on the distribution channel. Canceling the dependency, I mean, that's a big objective, it's very ambitious. Reducing it is uh, tremendous and necessary. And to reduce it, uh, I mean, you can always make the best product, but at the end of the day, the best product equates to the, the brand that is perceived as the best product. So what's more important, having the best product or having the brand that is perceived as the best product? Having the brand perception is the most important. You know, the best brand, the most sold brand, the brand that everybody wants, the best deal brand, the best quality brand. It, it doesn't have to be true. It just has to be what people think. So branding is very important. And therefore, all the activities that you need to do is in order to develop your brand, in order to minimize the, the difficulty you will have in doing the push. Because the push is, uh, on, is more effective the more your brand is famous. So let's give you an example. Imagine you are Virgin, no, no, RC Cola. You know, RC Cola is a, a soda like Coca-Cola is, it's a competitor of Coca-Cola. If you are Coca-Cola, what should you do? Versus if you are RC Cola, what should you do? So here the answer. If you are Coca-Cola, what you mostly do is you mostly do pull. People hear about Coca-Cola when they think, what do you want to drink? Coca-Cola, it's almost like a ship. It's almost like a trained uh, robot is you think Coca-Cola because you're trained to think Coca-Cola. So it's pull. So what happens with the channel of distribution? Well, the channel of distribution has no choices but to sell Coca-Cola. They try sometimes not to. And that's why you have franchise fast food that only has Pepsi or only has Coca-Cola because it's a policy inside. It's a trade uh, negotiation that they have where they only carry one or the other. That way, they're getting incentivized by the brand to carry one over the other. But Retailers don't, for the most part, 99.9% of the time, don't have a choice. They have to carry what the customer wants. So you are a Vans, for example, Albertsons. They don't have a choice. They could not say, hey, you know what? We're not going to carry Coca-Cola. We're going to carry RC Cola. If they do this for every product category, they're going to close business. So Coca-Cola is only going to do poor strategy because that way they're going to spend a lot of money in order to be needed or felt like needed by the customers. And the customers are gonna, they don't know that the customers, but they are essentially putting a lot of pressure on the retailer to carry the product. The retailer has no choices. In fact, most retailers don't wanna carry Coca-Cola because Coca-Cola has a, the smallest margin because it's the famous brand. All the famous brands are smaller margins for retailers. And if it was up to them, they would stop carrying the product because they want to carry the RC Cola. Because the RC Cola, is not as famous. The RC Cola cannot afford the poor strategy. Therefore, the RC Cola is more their friend. They have more interaction, uh, at, at least I should say, um, enjoyable interaction with the people from RC Cola than they have with the Coca Cola. The Coca Cola is telling them what to do. Coca Cola dictates what the, 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 the store does, the online store does. Um, RC Cola. Life is dictated by what well seller and retailers decide. So they engage in push strategy. If you buy X amount, I'll give you more for free. If uh, you do an event, I'll give you money and all this. So that's, that's why the brand is so important. The more you make your brand into Coca-Cola, the more you will have to spend money, uh, in percentage, a large percentage of money um, of the product for poor strategy but the easier it's going to be to negotiate. So it's like um, pluses and minuses. What costs more to negotiate with a wall seller or retailer or to spend money to get the customers to think you're the best? I mean, the history has shown 
that it's the there's a better return on the customers thinking you are the best. Okay. So I think it's fascinating actually push and pull because it's it's real life. Now the, that was the two strategies of uh, distribution, also of communication. But now there's three more strategies of distribution, and they're pretty simple. Uh, almost uh, nobody ever makes a mistake on these, so you, you don't want to be the first one because they're so simple. So the first strategy is called intensive distribution, which is the idea that you will sell everywhere. There's no uh, reason not to sell in any stores. So you sell everywhere, that's called intensive distribution. Selective distribution is the next level, which means that you sell in most places. The um, rationale behind this is that your product um, is not uh, different than anybody. Uh, it's at a low price and it's a convenience product. Therefore, it's intensive distribution. Now your product, is um, shopping product and therefore it's a selective product there is some competition there is some differentiation there's some brand preferences therefore it's selective distribution now you're more of a luxury good then you have exclusive distribution there's more specific agreement there's an issue with the uh, timing how long is the exclusivity there's an issue with the uh, territory how big is the area where that belongs to you and all of that. So not too complicated, those three strategies. Now more complicated, but now I've talked a lot about it uh, between and everything I've said, it's the concept of domination. Distribution and manufacturing are two of the uh, world that makes business. And there is some pressure. pressure. And I you know, think about this as a domination of one wants to dominate the other one. Um, and so I use this image of this uh, famous British program of Austin Powers, where you have sort of a spoof of James Bond, where you have this, the bad guy that wants to dominate the good guy, you know? And here the story is, who's the good guy? Is the manufacturer the good guy? Or is the manufacturer the bad guy? Who's the and obviously I have a little obviously a bias for this because I'm a manufacturer so um, yeah I do have a, have a bias but my perspective is and obviously it has been the perspective of the industry for the past 25 years is you've seen uh, distribution sort of um, becoming less powerful in the sense that consumers are able to buy directly from manufacturers. In fact, I went so far that I, uh, people can buy uh, directly from my website. Um, I actually stopped that two weeks ago, I think. Yeah, two weeks ago, I stopped the, the store, or at least the, um, my store is not functioning right now on my website. Uh, the reason for this is it was creating some kind of problem with my uh, Chinese distributor. So, uh, um, in terms of prices and there was all kinds of complication. And so I had to stop the store, but I'm going to put it back pretty soon. Um, and the idea with this is that way I, I can sell my product without intermediaries. So I, what's, the, what's the story behind this? Is it, if I have a, a product that is worth $100 and I sell it to a customer, $100, I make a, a, a good amount of money because maybe this product is worth 30 so if I sell it to a store 30, then they sell it to $100. So they make the $70. If I think that it's really bad to make $70, I can sell it less than $100. And therefore, one could imagine that I sell more. But the problem is if I sell it for less, the stores are going to see that I'm not being a good friend. And therefore, I'm selling it so less people are going to buy from me. Therefore, I'm sort of not being nice with them. And therefore, they're not going to carry my product. So I cannot sell it for much less. So I could do, you know, 95. If I was to do 95, it's possible that the stores will be okay with it. But if I start selling it 10% less and all this, the store will be upset and will not want to carry my product because they'll say that I'm a bad uh, manufacturer. So manufacturers 
and distributors are constantly playing games in terms of territory and prices. So that's what I call the bargaining power, where you have to see who gets what and who is stronger. So how do you, what is the bargaining power? So from the manufacturer perspective, is you, your power, you know, the Austin powers of the manufacturer is your mojo. I think that's what, that's what would be the name in the movie. Your mojo is that the fact that you have quality products. You make them so you know if it's, if it's good chocolate or bad chocolate you put in there, all right? And so the, the reputation is the fact that people um, know the image of your brand. They've heard about it. You have uh, certain features. Then there is the fact that you contribute to um, making profits. So people that carry your brand will be making some money. People want to make money with things that make money. So the more you're known to be bought, the more you can give them good margins, the more they like you. And then you have also what's called the consumer loyalty, which is that people have brand loyalty, which means that they care for your brand. They wait for your brand, they seek your brand, they recommend your brand. And this has an impact on how distributors is go are going to negotiate with you. Distributors are lazy, like I said, and they're only going to carry what's easy to sell. Easy to sell is usually what's cheaper. But the problem is if you're cheaper, you can't be a higher quality or you can't have a big reputation. But distributors are lazy. Give it to me cheap. You give it to them cheap, then your reputation is hurt. Then you come back and they say, buy more. I said, no, because your reputation hurt. Yeah, but my reputation hurt because you said that you to give you a good price, then I give you a good price and you sell, sold it cheap. So you have to be careful because everybody has to be on the same page and protect one another. If you sell a, one of your products that are usually expensive for cheap to a distributor, you have to make sure that the distributor doesn't use that differential of price to keep the price low. Because then that's going to hurt the, your image. And then the distributor is going to say, I won't sell buy your product anymore because you have a bad image yeah but you are the one that contributed to that um allegiance and memory are not good in the world of business most of the time uh, it's kind of a pessimistic view to look at this but it's very true so you have to protect yourself and make sure to keep your reputation and your price high as much as possible it's easier to go down than to go up so you protect that the distributor their bargaining power is the fact that they have a address they have a location so maybe it's the name you know amazon.com or whatever maybe it's the physical address maybe they are on rodeo drive or something like this the, uh, the physical location has also a sales volume which means that they sell a certain amount and that's very enticing for a brand because a brand sells one or two or three products to a consumer but it sells hundreds, thousands of products to the channel of distribution. So when you speak to a consumer, you, you know, imagine a car dealer um, that sells BMW. Um, consumers are important to you because they may be buying one BMW in their life or one, a best case scenario, I suppose, every year. Um, but a dealer is going to be buying thousands of cars. So the distributor, the dealer, has a huge bargaining power, which is you're not looking at the customer that's going to be buying one car. You are looking at a B2B customers that's going to be buying thousands of cars. So that sort of uh, change the relationship. And then finally, there's the consumer loyalty as well. People have loyalty for brands, for manufacturers, but they also have loyalty with where they buy them. So the channel of distribution has also loyalty. Do you have any question on these? Well, um, this is something that is extremely important. It's something that you don't know unless it's like, you know, how, how does it feel to be um, thirsty? If you've never, if you drink water every 25 seconds, you'll never be thirsty. So you start to imagine what it feels to be thirsty. And so it's the same thing here. These are um, elements that are not in the textbook. Um, I think it's, it's a bummer that they don't talk about this. And therefore that's why I brought it up to you because I think it is very important that you understand the equilibrium 
of negotiation that there is between a manufacturer and a distributor and how things uh, can be uh, weighted in one way or the other. Now, um, more um, academic, I would say, maybe a little bit less practical, but still very important, is to understand that when you have a distribution network, you have different agreements, you have different uh, relationship depending on with who. So these different relationships are, again, the difference between a retailer and wholesaler, seller, but also the ownership. So you could be uh, the manufacturer and own the wall selling and own the uh, retailing. And therefore you own the whole uh, distribution channel, but you could also be just owning the retailing or owning just the wall selling. Sometimes you don't own them, but you have a contract. So it's a, like a joint venture where you, there is no ownership, but there's just exchange of resources and the use of resources. Sometimes it's, um, it, it's not ownership, but it's more of a sponsoring where you will invest in the, in the, the, the processes and the, the, you know, the stages or the infrastructure of the distributor in order to get the distributor to focus on your brand. So in my situation, you could imagine that you invest in buying the shelves or you invest in the programming of the website. And as you invest in the programming of the website, you get to have a, a better, um, you know, it's like you are, you'll be on the first page of the website or the first page of the category because you have invested in the coding and the development design of the website, okay? So um, when you have different channels like this with different agreements, you have different conflict as well. And so as a manager of uh, the channels, you need to understand where is the conflict? So um, conflicts which are horizontal occurs among firms at the same level. So two retailers are complaining this is a horizontal conflict versus a wall seller and a retailer. This is a vertical conflict. Um, conflict happens, the most common conflict is because of prices. Um, because of prices, people feel like they have been taken advantage. So if you give a discount to someone and they don't use the general margin used by the industry, then they sell the product much less and that creates a perception by another retailer that you may have given them a better deal to that retailer. And then they wonder why they didn't get a good deal. What did they do? And for the most part, what you find is that um, oftentimes that intermediary maybe has a different policy in terms of margins. So let's talk about margins very quick because that's something so important as well which when I was a student really had no ID, to be honest. I had some ID, but I didn't know them very well. So um, manufacturer's margin, it's very hard to talk about it because there's so many differences. I mean, between someone that makes, that sells uh, strawberry at the farmer's market versus someone that sells diamond in New York, there's a different margin. However, um, I mean, diamond in New York, maybe there is a, a you know, 2000% margin versus the uh, strawberry at the farm market, maybe, uh, well, at the farmer's market, it's still gonna be high, maybe like uh, 30%, but strawberries to, um, to a chain, a supermarket chain, there you're gonna be making 6%. So imagine, which business do you want to be in? The businesses that make 2,000% or the businesses that make 6%. Okay, so oftentimes there's a difference in the volume, obviously, when you're in a six business, a 6% six margin business, you're selling you know, many trucks of that versus when you are in a uh, 1,000, 2,000% margin, uh, you don't usually sell by trucks, you sell in small quantities. 
that's true. But still, so just to look at something where the rules of thumb are, are pretty standard. Um, how much does a retailer margin tends to be? What is the margin of a retailer tends to be most of the time? I'm gonna take a guess and say about 30%. Yes, that's a good guess. So the retailer margins are between 30 and 50%. There are some that are 100 and there are some that are 15. Like for example, Costco, I think it's 15.7. Let's round it at 16%, right? Versus a store in, in like a fruit or like a small store in Bavillance might be 100%. But normally the rule of thumb is 30 to 50%. Um, that's for the retailer. Now, what about the wall sellers? So thank you, uh, Manuel, for your, uh, your answer. So 30 was like the minimum. What about a wall seller? Let's see your answer and then I'll comment on the difference between the two because one is much- 15 to 20. Yes, you're correct. The, the wall seller is much, is much less. Madeleine, write your name. We cannot hear you very well, but Madeleine, you said 15 to 20%, I think. So we can't, we can't hear you anymore, but- Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Correct. Correct. My internet is not very good today. Well, there's a lot of uh, uh, yeah. vibration when you speak, but um, the 15 to 20, um, that's, that's pretty low for a world seller, but there are some that are under 20, but, you know, yeah, so most world seller, you know, will be something like 18 to 25, I would say. Um, a world seller that is sort of greedy or selling a product that's pretty unique and they have a lot of work and waiting and it doesn't happen right away and it's small volume, uh, will take smaller volume, will take 30%. So that's rare. However, it's sometimes very good to anticipate. So how can you, you know, I told you, how can you do business? You can have to have money. You need to be a celebrity yourself, or you need to have connections. Um, now, the summary is another thing is to add to that, but that takes time, but it, it does pay off, is you make sure that you offer high margins to your trade, to the channel of distribution. What does that mean? That means that you need to make sure that the product that people are willing to buy and the price that you're selling is leaving a lot of space for the higher range of margins. So for the retailer is if you can do 50%, then it's great, better than 30. And for the wall seller, if you can do closer to 30%, it's better than the 15 or 20. And if you do this, and your product is sellable to the customers, then that's gonna really demultiply. It's gonna boost. It's gonna be a really good booster to your business because um, uh, the, the intermediaries are gonna hesitate less as long as they're also convinced that the manufacturer suge suggested price, retail price is, um, is realistic. So the best case scenario is that your MSRP manufacturer retailer suggested price is a little lower. Uh, it could not be a lot lower than what they expect. I mean, unless your retailer, dis distributor, all these people are not very good. Most of the time, they're extremely good at guessing what your price will be. And if they guess that your price could be higher than where you are, and while you're higher, you're lower than what they think you are, and they can still make the highest margin that they make anywhere, um, that's gonna increase the likelihood that they take your product big time because they're gonna take a risk on you. Just because based on the experience and perception, they can see how they could not sell some of your product and still make this big amount of money. So does that happen very often? 
and unfortunately it doesn't happen very often. Um, why it doesn't happen very often? It's because your product uh, to, to have a lower price as a small business, it's difficult because that was uh, the class prior to this one is you have economies of scales and all this that you cannot do if you're a small business. So your economies of scales are usually uh, bad, you know, not good compared to the one that do more product. So the one that do more product can sell the product less because they make more product and therefore they, they, it costs them less to make this product. Therefore, they get more support from the distribution. And also you, uh, again, making more product allows you to make extra um, profit, which is extra profit is used in a pool strategy, which means um, communicating and, and marketing directly to the consumers, which allows you to increase the demand and therefore you can sell more product. And it's all so, um, that's what business is about, is being in the right cycle. The right cycle is high margin, uh, high volume, low cost, more high volume, more high margin, and, and so forth and so forth. And you stay within this uh, vir uh, virtues of the value of your product, you being virtuous because you are able to manipulate, keeping your volume high, therefore your price low, which again makes more volume, more low price and so forth. So you wanna keep being virtuous with this. But the minute you step out from this, then the business doesn't work anymore as, as well. It doesn't become as seamless. And then that's when you get into conflict due to the prices and the different prices in different areas. So distribution, traditional way, is from manufacturer to wholesaler, retailer to consumers. So you have the traditional, you know, wholesaler, retailer in between. The vertical marketing system is when you integrate. You integrate by having a joint venture, you integrate by having ownership. So partial ownership, full ownership, some level of ownership, because this ownership allows you to, uh, to negotiate. So the negotiation that you get are uh, either to uh, increase how much the channel of distribution is going to buy, to also um, better take care of your product because they can spend more time, they're going to train more often the salespeople, they're going to ask more sales objective from the salespeople for these various um, uh, product that belongs to them. So, you know, they're going to be more on their toes with your product, and then they're going to be buying more products, therefore, that's another thing is if they buy more products, usually from you, they also spend more time on your product because it's, it's a question of inventory. And then you can sell more product, produce more product, reduce your cost and all this. So, so that's what everyone's trying to do in business is run after your own tail, which is to produce more in order to save more, in order to sell more, in order to produce more. And, and it's a circle that you fulfill. So. The conventional marketing system, it's different intermediaries playing their role. The vertical marketing system is when you have some integration where you have wall seller, which is also retailing or the retailer that is buying so much from various supplier in large quantities. That way they can have an integrated wall selling business, right? The uh, vertical marketing system from a retail perspective could be having a, um, Domino's pizza inside the Home Depot. That is also a vertical marketing system where there's an integration. So the logistic function are therefore to understand the cost. And I told you about my own um, difficult time right now having containers that used to be 3,500 and then they went to 25,000. Now they back down to uh, 18,000, 17,000. But that's still more expensive than 3,500. And so you share, they take responsibility of some of the costs and, the, and these functions are very important in order for the business to roll. Um, the, 
Okay, so this I discussed. So now, marketing logistics is not just about getting the product to your store or to your warehouse. It's also getting the product to the customers. So marketing logistics is not just about the inbound, the products coming to your company in order to convert it into a product that will be sold to, the, to your customers. The inbound and the outbound are both very important to manage. Now, um, supply chain and value chain. So the supply chain are the um, element, it's, it's essentially talking about the inbound you getting products from multiple people. Now, you have to think about the, 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 the assembly that you're gonna do. Not everything that you sell comes from the same supplier. So there's a lot that comes from multiple suppliers. So you have to make sure all, all the orders are being produced and all the orders are being fulfilled by having um, all the different elements to make this order come at the same time or have stuck at the same time. Um, obviously, I said, you know, the logistics, I think in business right now, um, I mean, even finding money is not as difficult as the logistics because there's a lot of wealthy people that are looking for ways to spend their money. So finding money is not as difficult, but it's organizing the logistics. And in my situation, um, uh, you know, uh, finding, um, Finding cardboard is not easy. Finding glass for making bottles is not easy. Finding the people to, to do the finish touch on the cardboard for the, the creases and, and finding the machine that are available. And, and then the machine, when they stop working, there's a, a delay because the, the tools to fix it and the parts to fix it, there's a delay. Everything is more complicated to the point that I think to survive this, you really need to not stress. And I think before I used to stress with every step, but now the, every step has a problem, and therefore you just you just uh, keep on moving. You know, it's, a, it's you don't stop. You just don't stop. You just keep dealing with the problem as they come. When you do the logistics, you also think about the different methods of uh, moving your product. So each one of these different methods have advantages and disadvantages, the rail, the track, the water. So depending on what you're moving, there is methods which are more adapted. So if it's something that is dangerous, if it's something that is heavy and bulky, if it's something that is rare and uh, exclusive or, or something that will require security, all of this, you know, so security, you won't go with air, or something that is, um, sort of dangerous, and you will go with a water or, or rail, as something that needs faster uh, delivery and going into more places, more flexibility of where you can go, you will use trucks, something that is very bulky and where time is not an issue, you will use water. And then you could also use some pipeline for specific goods, okay? So all, everything has advantage and you decide in, in terms of how quickly do you need, so the speed, um, how uh, important it is to be on time, maybe because it's uh, perishable or something like this. Um, also the flexibility of where does it go, where it doesn't go, then the cost, the cost based on what you're selling. So for example, I sell different cognacs from simple cognacs to fancy expensive cognacs. So the simple cognacs will never take the plane because it's not justified, because the clients that buy the simple cognacs, um, they, they mix it. Uh, there's maybe not too much differences between the products versus my expensive cognacs. The brand, they see, the, the buyers see a big difference in the quality of it. And there's a difference of price. And therefore, um, you know, a change of $10 doesn't make much difference if the people will buy or not buy it. So that's the cost. And then the flexibility is how easy um, it is to work with. So for example, uh, right now the air is a, such a good flexibility, but it used to be very, I mean, it's still very expensive, but the differential between the air 
and the land has become uh, smaller because the land became so expensive. So some more and more times, uh, shipping through the air is becoming, is making more sense. Uh, it has not expanded the prices increased by uh, the same ratio. So it has increased by 10% versus the price for the land has increased by um, uh, six or 700%. So these variations are very important. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the concept of retailing and the concept of world selling. So retailing, I, as I defined it before, is selling directly to the final consumers for their personal use. And that's the primary thing that you do. So it's not like retailing is just this. It's the majority of what you do. If the majority of what you do is to sell to a business for the business to use what they bought in order to produce another service or another good, that is called world selling. World sellers may be retailing and retailers may be world selling. Costco, for example, is normally a world seller that also retails. Right? And so um, because of the difficulty to do business, there are a lot of world sellers that has started also uh, retailing. So it's maybe a place that sells one mile of material or 50 yards of material. Now you can go and buy two yards, 10 yards, a smaller amount. They have to adjust. The retailers, um, when you talk about the retailers, you don't talk about the product um, portfolio or product line, sorry. You don't talk about the product line, you pro talk about the product assortment. So the assortment, again, it goes into what we talked for the product line, the depth, the width, and the length. So here again, you have a question about, you have a store, and in that store, uh, what are you gonna sell? Just shoes. If it's just shoes, therefore it's a product depth and not so much of a product width because you don't sell vegetable and you don't sell um, beauty products, you only sell shoes. Now you could have a, a store which sells different categories of products, but in not many variations. And in that situation, you would have a, a good width, but not a lot of depth. Then the next thing about your assortment is the conditions of the quality that you offer. So the, the, the quality, the level of quality. So some uh, store will be a, uh, no frail, like I mentioned, uh, a 99 cent store. And then you, can, you could have a Neiman Marcus or something, or Saks or, um, or a Chanel store or whatever, where there will be different level of services being offered with a different quality. So that's part of your positioning. And that's decided at a strategic level is what is going to be the width and depth of our product assortments? What is the quality level that we offer? And how much services do we offer for our customers? Then lastly is this concept of store atmospheres is how will the store look like and how will the, the people like the store and what will the store image is perceived by the customers? 